Dr. Cynthia Burnson received her PhD in Human Development and Family Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has served as a senior researcher at Evident Change since 2018. Evident Change is a nonprofit that uses data and research to improve child welfare, juvenile and adult justice, and adult protective services systems. At, Evidence Cha at Evident Change, Dr. Burnson works with child welfare systems to improve decision-making, use data for systems improvement, and evaluate interventions. Prior to evident change, Dr. Burnson was with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she studied postpartum depression treatment in Wisconsin home visiting programs, infant and family mental health, and the assessment of parent-child relationships. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Burnson. Thank you. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, over in a virtual way today. Thank you so much for attending. My name is Cynthia Burnson. I'm here to talk about science driven strategies for successful video interaction with children. And so I'm um, going to talk a little bit about what do we know developmentally from a research perspective about how to interact with very young children? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the um, areas of strength and the pros and cons? And how you all can make those interactions go a little bit better? We'll use some video examples and hopefully have some opportunity for some engagement and some discussion. So to get started, I just want to let you know a little bit about myself and, and how I came to be here speaking on this topic. I work for a nonprofit organization called Evident Change. Um, I myself am in Madison, Wisconsin. Evident Change, as was mentioned in the introduction, we work with child welfare, juvenile justice, adult protective services, um, and education. Most of my work is in the child welfare space. And so we partner with these systems professionals and, and we really look to get at the root of those big challenges. And we're also a research organization, so we're data driven in the work that we do. Before I get started, I want to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, that's a practice of ours at Evident Change, where we take a moment to honor the traditional stewards of our land. In my case, that I come to you from Madison, Wisconsin, which is uh, the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation. So I want to take a moment to pay tribute to their contributions to our community and stewardship of the land, both past, present, and emerging. Emerging, emerging, emerging. Okay, so first I want okay, to do a little bit about myself. Oh, oh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure if anyone else is hearing that one. Okay, I think it's gone. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to be uh, interested in this topic of virtual interaction with young children. And so, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I worked in a variety of sort of child development spaces, home visiting, postpartum depression. Um, and a lot of my work and research was focused on children who had a parent incarcerated, so in a jail or a prison. And we did observational research, so I would go to jails and watch young children aged two to six uh, do a visit with their parent. And sometimes that was an in-person visit where maybe they were at a table, you know, at the correctional facility. Sometimes there was a plexiglass barrier and the children had to speak into a, a telephone handset. But more and but more, 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 more was sort of a closed circuit Skype type situation where um, a caregiver and the child would go to the jail, um, but rather than see rather their than parent in person, they would actually be looking at a video screen and then use a phone to interact with that individual who was um, in the facility, in the correctional facility. And so we noticed a lot about how very young children were able to sort of take in that interaction and how critical it was that that caregiver who had brought them to visit was able to scaffold that interaction. So that was one kind of thread of research where I became interested in um, sort of this video interaction with young children. In addition, I had some experience in the media studies world. So um, looking at can young children learn from video or from iPads or interactive media and things like that. Uh, so that was an area of study of mine. And then finally, when 
COVID hit, when the pandemic came, um, there was a lot more interest in understanding how much can children learn from and understand an interaction that takes place over video screens. So when this began happening, I heard from a friend of mine uh, who works in the public defender office here in Wisconsin asking me, what is the research? Um, what do we know about whether kids can get value out of that kind of interaction? And does it depend on the age? Does it depend on what else is going on? And so I wrote up a quick little fact sheet to sort of help uh, people who were faced with this very fast transition into what used to be in-person visits, um, particularly in that child welfare context, that were now all of a sudden being transferred to a video type format, where perhaps a child's in foster care and they're going to continue doing those visits with their parent, right. um, but rather than being in person, they're going to be over a Zoom or a FaceTime or whatever it is. So all that came together and um, brought me to this topic that I'm going to talk to you about today. And I also have, you know, additional resources that that we can distribute with some, you know, links to different activities to do with kids over video chat and a little more explanation around the science um, that we have to keep in mind when we think about developmentally where are young children at uh, and how much are they able to engage and interact in that type of a format. So I want to get started with a poll to get us engaged here. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and pull up this poll here. So the way to engage in this poll is at the top here, you can either on your computer go to pollev.com slash nccd. And if you go to that on your browser, then you'll be able to respond to this poll. Or you can text the letters NCCD to the phone number 22333. So if you're on text, you're at NCCD in the message. Oh, there we go, someone's got it. And then you text that message to 22333. Um, and then it will join the session and we'll have a couple more of these throughout and then you can select A or B. Have you interacted with young children over video over the last two years? So go ahead and take a moment um, and get either on the computer or via text into that session just to get a sense of this is an experience that you all have had over the last couple of years. Young children thinking, you know, under the age of five or six or so, um, have you interacted with a young child over video over the last two years? All right, we've got kind of a, almost like a half and half so far. I see that it's changing as more people take a moment to weigh in. All right, so now going up a little bit more with the yeses. More, so lots, this is, looks like an experience that the majority of people have had over the last couple of years. We'll give it maybe, you know, 15, 20 more seconds to see who else weighs in here. Okay, it's going up and up with the yeses here. All right, it looks like we're evening out about, you know, so, oh, oh, it's going up a little, about three quarters have had the experience of interacting with a young child over video over the past two years. I would expect that maybe that uh, percentage would have looked differently had I asked this question, you know, four years ago. Um, but this is a really common experience. This is a technology that children are engaging in, whether it be professionally, you know, looking at court systems or child welfare systems or juvenile justice systems, or uh, maybe something personal, keeping in touch with family members and other children um, who may not live close by for, for those regular visits. All right, great, excellent. I'm happy to see that people were able to kind of get in the session here. So the next question I have for you then is going to be, um, when you think about interacting over video with young children, for those three quarters of you who have done that, or if you haven't and you've just heard about it, what's one word that comes to mind? What's the first word, uh, first thought, best thought? Um, just what's one word come, that comes to mind? And we'll give a little extra time to make sure folks on the live stream are able to kind of catch up with anyone. So we'll give 
we'll give a good couple of minutes for this as we watch these words pop off as you put them in. I'm seeing a lot of words come in here. I know there's a little bit of a delay with the live stream, so I'll give it a little extra space, uh, maybe about another minute or so and see what we get. Lots of people putting in some words and there's definitely some themes coming up here. All right, it's looking like most folks have had a chance to weigh in here. I'm not seeing a lot of new, new things come in. So the words that I'm seeing here, distracted is the biggest one. So that means kind of the most responses on that. Challenging, confusion, chaos, chaotic, a lot of variations on that theme, um, but also some entertaining, um, you know, uh, things around attention, you know, is it short, disjointed, um, can be difficult. I see the word span. I will assume that that comes with attention span, that children may not have, you know, a lot of attention to devote to a longer video visit. So uh, really clear themes here. Chaos, difficult, frustrating, but also um, entertaining and sometimes effective we're seeing as well. So we're seeing some uh, kind of pros and cons in that list here. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and switch back over to the slides here. Okay, so for the, the goals for today, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the developmental research on children and video interaction. What we know about where kids are, where kids are, where kids are developmentally, and how that affects their ability to interact over video. And um, so one goal is to better understand that developmental research. Second one's gonna be to learn some strategies to interact with children over video. And we'll use some video clips to um, kind of try those on and see them in action or areas uh, of improvement. And then finally, we'll discuss the pros and cons of video interaction with children, particularly in systems. Systems meaning, um, you know, child welfare system, court proceedings, situations where it's not necessarily, you know, grandma catching up with her grandchild, but it's, it's something that's part of a larger effort or goal that requires interaction with that child or promotes interaction with that child for a particular purpose. So some of those examples, just to get a little more clear about what we're talking about in this specific um, scenario, children in foster care may be visiting parents. If those parents are working towards reunification, we know that that family time, that visitation time is very critical in that process and making sure that, that visit, those visits are regular, regular, regular. positive, um, and that they're, hap they're a source of, um, keeping that connection going both for the child but also for the parent to to maintain that relationship as they work towards that goal of reunification there also may be instances where caseworkers and children are doing assessments or check-ins either in an in-home case or in an out-of-home uh, setting there's lots of times when um, professionals need to be checking in with kids and, and seeing how they're doing and asking them questions and potentially even doing some assessment. Then of course, court hearings that involve children. Um, a lot of those are often are, have been online recently. Um, and so that's another setting. And then as I mentioned earlier, visits at correctional facilities, which is something where we saw a lot of this technology being used even before um, the COVID pandemic was being relied on more and more almost as a way to to work with security issues at the facility. Um, and so those were going on as well. Um, now I'm not sure if I'm able to like hear or see a chat, um, but if there's anything I've missed, please uh, chime in on that. I would love to hear if there's any other scenarios in which you have been involved in video interaction with children in a systems context. Um, okay, so actually I have one more poll for you and I'll give it extra time again because of that delay. So knowing that those are the systems areas that we are seeing this video interaction happening, I'm curious to hear from your professional experience, um, what on balance, you think the effect of that has been on children and families over the next, or over the last few years, we've seen 
um, a lot of very fast pivoting towards a video solution for keeping connections going. In a lot of cases, those have been sort of walked back, but in some cases, they may continue to be a useful tool. And so I wanted to get your opinion on, you know, what, how you think that's gone and what the impact has been for children and families. So one moment, I'm just going to get uh, that one up here. All right. Here we go. So we've got one more using that same text or video. Overall, what has the impact of video conferencing options been on children and families involved in systems, meaning child welfare, juvenile justice court, and things like that, ranging from it's been very helpful, maybe somewhat helpful, overall neither helpful nor unhelpful, or if maybe if you think there's been some things that have been really good about it and some things not so good, somewhat unhelpful or very unhelpful. So we'll give um, a minute or so to kind of get a understanding of what people's opinions are on using video interaction with young children. Okay, so it's looking like the majority um, are in the somewhat helpful opinion here, um, about 13% saying very helpful. Um, and then about 13% saying it's neither helpful nor unhelpful. So maybe on balance, um, it's been kind of a wash. And then about almost 10% of folks thinking it's been actually somewhat unhelpful. It hasn't been a thing that's really enhanced the experience for children and families. I see we're still moving a little bit here. Um, going on. So that, that's helpful to know. So I'm always curious, you know, people sometimes have strong opinions about you know, whether this has been on average kind of a gain for children and families or whether it's been something that's really damaged the experience. So I see uh, most folks are in that kind of somewhat helpful area. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I have a little a question, question for you. Uh, and it's just to reflect on how, when there's new technology that comes up, um, you know, how is it received and sometimes having folks kind of adapt to it takes a little bit of time. So this quote here um, is about a, what was at the time a brand new technology. And I'm curious if anyone has any guesses on what technology that is or was. The quote is that it will ever come into general use notwithstanding its value is extremely doubtful because its beneficial application requires much time and gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner. So uh, take a guess for yourself. Um, I'm not uh, sure if I'm going to be able to see anyone's guesses here. So if you are correct, you can uh, feel proud about it. Once I show you the answer in a few moments, we'll give maybe 10, 15 seconds to think this one over. What new technology is this? All right, and the answer is a stethoscope, a stethoscope. So when the stethoscope first came out, um, there was a concern that would be, it would deprofessionalize physicians, that relying on a tool like this would undercut their professional judgment of a heartbeat. A uh, similar resistance was made to the thermometer. Physicians or doctors would feel a forehead, and kind of get a sense of whether the person was healthy in that way. And when the thermometer came out, there was a similar concern that it would deprofessionalize uh, physicians and their work and would sort of undercut their professional development. And so the point I'm making with this is just that all technology has those pros and cons. Um, and that the point of this talk today is not to sort of, you know, sell you on videos you visits with young kids or, or say that they're terrible, but really just knowing that with every new technology, we see these pros and cons and how can we make it go the best that it can, knowing what we know about children, how they learn, how they take in this kind of video. So the framing for this, the developmental research around media, around video and young children, uh, we often think about the three C's. What are the three things that affect the success or lack thereof um, in that video interaction with children? And first we think about the child, things about the child themselves that we need to keep in, to keep in mind when thinking through that interaction and 
what kind of adaptations we may need to make. The second is content. So that's the content of what's going on on the screen. You know, if it were a TV show, it'd be what's on the show, but if it's an interaction, it's what's going on in that interaction. What kind of conversation, what kind of purpose, what kind of back and forth is going on. And then the third C is context. So this is more about the overarching purpose for that interaction, as well as who else may be there to help prepare the child and also scaffold the child through that interaction. So we're gonna talk through these one at a time, child, content, and context. I'll show you an example for each one. And um, we'll, see, we'll uh, think about what do we know developmentally that has to do with that C, and what are some strategies we can use when interacting with those young children based on that science. All right, so the first C is gonna be child. So this is thinking about the child's age or developmental stage. It's thinking about the child's temperament and interests. It's thinking about their attachment history and style. And then finally, it's understanding what the child understands about the interaction or about that video interaction there. So with age and development, we think about um, whether children are able to take in what is happening. So in the developmental research, there's a phrase that used to be called the video deficit, and now we call it the transfer deficit. And this was a phenomenon that researchers noticed where very young children were, were um, not able to learn from video. So they would see something on a screen, and then when they were asked to sort of um, take in that information and demonstrate that they had learned something, say a new word or how to do a puzzle or something like that. There seemed to be this kind of age cutoff where children just were not able to do that. They weren't able to take in something that was presented on a 2D screen and learn from it, demonstrate that they had learned. So that was called the video deficit or what we now call the transfer deficit. And researchers noticed that that tended to be approximately uh, kids up until the age of about two and a half or three had that video deficit or that transfer deficit. But as the research went on and as technology um, advanced, they noticed there were actually some things that we could do to overcome the transfer deficit in young children. And those are things like back and forth interactions. Um, those are things like knowing the person, having some kind of relationship with the person on the screen, as well as some other sort of tips and tricks. And so that's really relevant to that video interaction with young children, because without knowing how to sort of overcome those, we would be concerned that children under the age of three or two and a half or so really weren't, aren't able to engage, but we actually do know that they so can. Second would be temperament and interest. So I remember in that word cloud, we saw a lot of attention span, um, yeah, chaos, distractibility, and thinking about, you know, some kids are, are able to sit and take things in for longer, and some kids uh, may have that shorter attention span just as part of their natural temperament. And so keeping that in mind, uh, as well as the interests of the child. So for example, when I would go, you know, maybe on a work trip from time to time, um, my seven-year-old son and I would get together. I used to do just a phone chat with him and it, it never worked out, right? I'd say, how was school? I feel like, fine. And I could feel him just like wanting to get off the phone, right? It wasn't a, an engaging interaction for him. Um, but then I set it up so that we would could play Minecraft together, right? Like I'm a Minecraft person, he's a Minecraft person. We're like in a little world together and playing and matching my interaction to his interests um, really helped get that engagement a lot more, uh, a, a lot better and keep that connection a lot stronger. So keeping in mind those temperament and interests. Uh, third thing is that attachment history and style. And this is particularly relevant when we think about video interaction in a system context. So if this child is interacting with somebody who is a caregiver of theirs, they have some kind of an attachment history. It may be a secure attachment um, with a strong bond. It may have been a fractured one or one characterized by avoidance or ambivalence. And when they see that person, there's gonna be some attachment system activation. 
and that can look like distress, that can look like dysregulation, and that can, uh, that can present in a child in a lot of different ways. So keeping in mind, who is this child going to be interacting with, and what is their history with them, and how might that show up in the interaction? And then finally, the fourth thing the fourth is, um, is um, the child's the understanding child's of the situation. situation. Oh, there's a little echo. I'm going to wait for that to dissipate. There we go. Um, and so is the child able to understand, you know, why are they talking to somebody? Uh, kind of what's going on? Who is this person? That's going to impact as well how that video interaction goes. So knowing all these pieces of what we need to think about with the child, um, that age and developmental stage, temperament and interests, attachment history and style, understanding of the situation, what are some strategies we can use to uh, improve that video interaction? First is keeping it short, and I saw that on the word cloud, short, attention span, things like that. Um, as a rough guide, we think about about five minutes per year of the child's age. So maybe a one-year-old could do a five-minute, a uh, two-year-old could do a 10-minute, three-year-old could do a 15-minute, and so on. That obviously is going to depend on that individual child, but that's just a rough guide. Um, we often talk about a language barrier when we work with young children, and I don't mean, you know, a language like English or Spanish or French, but a language that children are most fluent in um, when they're young is play. So having that conversation of how was school today, you know, what you've got going on tomorrow, that's not going to go as well with young children when you're trying to create a connection and you're trying to work with them. Um, than their, their own natural language, which is play. So thinking through what kind of playful activities can we come up with to keep that interaction going. As I mentioned before, expecting distress, especially if this is a situation where that attachment system may be activated because of interacting with somebody from whom that child has had some kind of a separation. Uh, that's something just to be expected in those scenarios. And then finally, the importance of following the child's lead. And so you may come in with 10 great ideas on how to in, engage with this child, um, but if the child has some other idea in mind, it's really time to switch gears and follow that child's lead as much as possible. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, there's an echo. Okay. Um, I think you did a really good job in the video of following the lead of the young person, um, as well as coming prepared with some type of play activity. So having the dragon, trying to engage in that conversation, but when they didn't show interest, you were like, all right, show me your world. Let's just roll with it and engage. So that's mm -hmm. some of my takeaways. Yeah, great. And you noticed how, right, I was like, oh, I got this, we're going to play this puppet show, we're going to do these cookies, and she was like, eh, I'm not into it. So go in a different direction. Um, yeah, that's definitely, uh, definitely one example of that. Oh, somebody said you followed the child's lead by seeing the playroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we had that, you know, I think the other day someone mentioned that video chat with young children kind of makes them dizzy. Uh, and in this case, right, um, Lily's got the phone and she's taking me on this, you know, up and down tour of everything in her room and like where she's playing and also speaks to her temperament, right? She's very outgoing, she's engaged, um, and maybe with a child that's more reserved or more shy, that might not have been the way to go in that, ex in that particular example. Mm -hmm. Anything else you noticed in that video?
I think that's it from the room okay. here, Cynthia. Great, thank you, thank you. I'm glad I'm able to hear folks, so I appreciate that. All right, we'll move on then to the next C, which is content. So this is thinking about um, what is the content of the interaction? What kind of activities are you bringing? Books, playing, a back and forth? And the key phrase I want us to think about here is that back and forth, or what we call in the research contingent responsivity, right? Which is just saying that serve and return, that back and forth. And what a lot of research found early on in these kind of media studies was that when you added the ability for the person on the screen to respond to and change gears with the person on the other side of the screen, children were much more able to engage, much more able to learn from that kind of video screen as opposed to something that's just sort of static. And this is actually something we see very, very young, uh, as young as five months of age, in fact. So for example, in one study, um, they had these very young children, five months and up, and they showed them either a static video of a person just you know kind of interacting but there's no back and forth because it's pre-recorded um, but then they also compare that to a face-to-face -face interaction so kind of you know the traditional you're in the room together um, as well as a video back and forth so where the person's on a video but they're able to respond to the baby's cues and to kind of do that back and forth and what they found was that there was no difference in the amount of attention that those babies were able to pay to the face-to-face -face and the video back and forth but they didn't pay much attention at all to that static video so they're definitely hooking into that back and forth that contingent responsivity when there is that ability to go back and forth. So we do know that babies, even as young as five months of age, are able to interact with somebody on a screen over a video. But they also noticed that the babies smiled more in the face-to-face -face interaction. And so when we think about how babies communicate, you know, you have your visual your, uh, back and forth, you have touch, and then also that audio input. And obviously in a video context, only some of those can be present. Um, so you're not gonna get that touch from that person, of course, uh, but you can get that audio, although it could be affected by glitches or echoes or all kinds of good technology, stuff like that. Um, and you're also able to do that eye contact. Um, uh, interestingly, it's not just the babies who are very, very sensitive to that contingent responsivity, that back and forth, it's also parents. So in another study, they had mothers interact with their baby over kind of a Zoom back and forth. And, but in one condition, they kind of secretly, instead of showing the baby live, they kind of snuck in little pre-recorded bits. And it was very, very subtle where you wouldn't notice it by just looking. Um, but it, but it was different for that mother. And what they found was that the mothers were much less engaged in the condition where there was some of those pre-recorded bits. So we know that parents and babies in particular are very sensitive to even slight differences on that contingent responsivity. So we really wanna think about that back and forth, the serve and return kind of cycle that helps children stay engaged, that helps children form connections, that helps children learn. Um, over that video. And so some of the barriers to that would be the lack of touch is part of that. Um, and also some of the difficulties that come into play when we think about eye contact, which is also very important to babies. So we know, for example, babies can tell the difference if you are staring into their eyes versus staring uh, at their forehead. You know, they've done experiments where they sort of contrast those and babies are much more distressed and don't don't prefer somebody who wasn't able to make that that eye contact, but we know that sometimes our cameras on our phones are kind of like down low or they're off to the side or they're in strange places. So that's one thing that does sometimes affect the quality of that interaction. So when we think about these things, contingent responsivity, that back and forth, how critical that is to focus on and to allow a little bit for the barriers that technology, that video technology is gonna throw in our path, as well as thinking about play, conversations and other activities that you may bring um, to as a plan for that interaction, whether or not the child ends up going for them or not. So some strategies. 
um, thinking about that research around very young children and how we can think about that to improve that engagement and connection, plan multiple activities and approaches. So have, you know, lots of ideas on how you might be able to engage that child. Um, allow for lag time and tech glitches. So um, I think everybody's had the experience by now, sort of the talking over in Zoom as you're sort of waiting. And even today when we have the YouTube live stream is running a little bit behind, you know, the real time, just uh, giving a little more spaciousness, being a little bit more patient to make sure that that contingent responsivity isn't impaired, isn't impaired by those by tech that issues. Line, tech that line, issues. Line, that line, and then finally, focusing on attention and eye contact. Um, another useful concept from the child development literature is joint visual attention. So, you know, somewhere around toddlerhood, uh, children learn how to direct your attention to something. Um, they'll point, they'll show, and it creates a joint object of attention. And it's a very important developmental space for young children to be in and a very big milestone to know what I'm looking at, I want you to look at, and now we are both looking together. That's that shared experience, that joint visual attention that can be challenging over, um, over video. So thinking about, do you need to adjust the frame? Need to back up? Um, can you get the child to sort of give you more information about what it is that they're looking at that, that they want you to look at? Um, so we're going to watch another video with a, another, with a younger the young baby um, and think about this, particularly the contingent responsivity and how technology may impact that and how that interaction is shaped by things like eye contact and things like uh, back and forth type of an interaction. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm get that up. Okay, so having looked at that video there and thinking about these strategies, um, planning um, different planning activities different and, approaches, and, approaches, and, approaches, and approaches, approaches, allowing for that lag time, those tech glitches that are inevitable, and also that focus on attention eye contact as well as that back and forth. What did you notice what did in you that notice? video what what did about you notice? those things? <laughs> that you need to give the child time to respond to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there something specific in there that you've noticed that um, where that was kind of happening or not happening? Jennifer in the chat didn't elaborate. Okay. okay thanks. Seems to take an awful lot of energy to be able to converse with a small child. Mm hmm. She is working so hard, isn't she? You know, and I think it's about when we compare it to the almost four year old who I mean, she probably would have chatted with for me for an hour, you know, and I think we made it about 15 minutes. Um, this child's about nine, 10 months old. Um, we're looking at a lot of effort for maybe, you know, four or five minutes of that interaction. And then that's going to be, you know, where you are with a child of that age. Yeah, mom's working real hard. Anything else you noticed about um, how the technology child has a longer attention oh. span than I would have expected from Julie in the chat? Chat, chat. Okay. Chat. Okay. Yeah. So she yeah. was able to stay engaged for maybe longer than than one would expect, even though she's quite young. Thank you. Anything else that anyone noticed from that video clip around? Um, Around, um, around, um, around, um, around, um, around. Uh, Jennifer said it was just one question after another. Mm -hmm.
Right, so thinking maybe that plays right. into also how are you going to interact with a child of that age? And there's lots of strategies around, you know, you could pretend to share a snack, you can um, sing a song or do finger plays and things like that. Requires a lot of, you know, prep work. Um, and I've got a list of some good resources for those that we'll send out afterwards. But uh, it's not going to be like calling up your best friend and like talking about their day when it's a baby, thinking through, you know, what is that interaction going to look like and, and how might it be most successful? Mom asked baby to clap because mom knew baby could and perhaps likes to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's a moment where that technology Come got on. in the way, right? Oh, yes. Because she's clapping like this. Um, which maybe is not the way baby is thinking of because she's you know, holding her phone you know, with their other hand. So there's really no way to do that type of a clapping. All right, all good? All right. Excellent. I like this communication style we're getting. It's it's working. All right. So now we're looking at our final C, which is the context. And here I really want to talk about the role of the other individual, right? So when we're talking about young children, typically, typically you know, you're not having a 12-month-old uh, pick up a phone or a computer and decide to FaceTime somebody. There's another adult or older child involved in making it happen and potentially scaffolding that interaction, how important that can be to, um, to make the engagement successful. So thinking about what is the purpose of the video chat, it's going to be different if you're trying to get certain types of information versus just there to, you know, play and, and connect and have a good time for a couple of minutes. Who is the other adult? And here the concept we think of a lot is triadic interaction. So a dyadic interaction is just maybe a parent and a child, just two people. But video chat but video is chat, often, but is often chat, triadic but interaction. Just hearing an echo, so I'm just waiting for a moment. Okay. So that triadic interaction is obviously much more complex. Now you're talking about three people um, who are involved in making an interaction together and really focusing on that triadic interaction and what is the role going to be. So you imagine a situation where perhaps you're doing um, a visit with a, with a child and the other person, the other adult, who's physically with the child, you know, they could either sit there and kind of help interpret and help guide the interaction. They might just hand the phone or the iPad or whatever it is to the child and just let them take care of it, much less likely to be successful. And thinking through uh, planning ahead. How long is this going to be? How are we going to say goodbye? What is my role in structuring this, con this engagement so that it can be successful? And how do we know when to kind of call it quits? You know, how do we know when it's time to wrap it up and say goodbye? Um, one thing I witnessed a lot when I observed visits between young children and their parent in jail was how critical that caregiver was in supporting the child in being able to interact with that person, with their parent in a positive way, redirecting their attention. And one of the most distressing parts of those visits was often a very, very sharp timer, right? So if it's at the correctional facility, there's maybe a timer that goes down and a two-year-old is, is not gonna understand there's 30 seconds left, but when that timer goes down, the it just goes blank. Just goes so blank. the caregiver just goes, just goes has a huge role in preparing that child for the ending, when we think about attachment, when we think about self-regulation, beginnings and endings, very critical for how that child's going to be able to engage and, and have some closure to the interaction. Um, one thing that we do know about um, children is that they are able to get emotional input, yeah. emotional support yeah. over a video, even at a young age, even as toddlers. So in one study, for example, um, they had toddlers 12 months up, um, 12 months to about 24 months in a playroom. 
And in one condition, you know, the mother would leave and the child would become upset, become distressed. Um, it, however, in a different condition, they had the mother leave, but actually kind of Skype into the room, you know, be on a Zoom, a video chat, so that the child could hear and interact with that mother, even though she wasn't physically present in the room. And in that condition, the toddlers displayed much less distress and were much more able to regulate until that mother came back into the room. Um, similarly, we know that children are more soothed with the visual input that video interaction compared to just compared audio alone. To so if we compare a child who's distressed, a, a young child with getting just that audio input from their caregiver, that's not as effective as also effective adding on to that video. To so, we so we do have evidence. So we do have evidence. So we do have evidence. Just waiting for the echo evidence. here. Just waiting for the echo that children, very young children, down to toddlers, are able to get an emotional um, soothing and an emotional connection over that video interaction, even if it's maybe not as good as that in-person, of course. So thinking about strategies, um, first of all, just planning with that other adult and attending to what kind of relationship that is. Um, and then as an additional strategy, just thinking more globally, thinking about the equity access issues around video interaction. So if this is something that's being implemented in a system, making sure that there's equitable access to, um, you know, good internet or good technology as much as possible. So that's just something I want to mention to keep uh, in mind as we're thinking about when, how, and with whom to use this different video technologies, really keeping in mind that not everyone has the same access to those tools. Um, so overall, thinking through the triadic interaction, what is the role of the other adult in sort of scaffolding that conversation back, for, back and forth? So I'm going to show you one more video clip. Um, and you can think about all the tips from, you know, the child, from the context, from the content as you watch this. And then um, we can discuss it after that. So one moment here. Okay, so thinking about that uh, video clip and that triadic interaction, um, as well as the other tips that we talked about, what did you notice um, about that video clip and engaging that child in that interaction? It took them a little while to get the like communication down between which adult would speak when, um, but the male figure did a really good job of holding the camera and help kind of navigating um, and just supporting her and staying engaged in the conversation. Yeah, he did say he would repeat sometimes, um, show uh, if she pointed, do a little bit of showing. Jennifer in the chat said engaging all her senses, present and past, that both adults did this. And Julie in the chat said she liked how dad helped out with the conversation between mom and dad. All right. Um, okay, so those are the three C's. Just to recap, we talked about uh, child, suiting, you know, um, child structuring the interaction to their uh, structure development, their age, their, their interests, their attachment. Oh, I've got to echo, so I'm just going to wait a moment. I've got to echo, so I'm just going to wait a moment. All right. Thank you. Thank you, friendly tech support individual. Appreciate it. It was sounding a little bit like a remix <laughs> style. All right, so we're talking about video interaction in systems. Um, just recapping around the child content and context um, and thinking about where is that child at? What is their history with that individual that they're going to be um, chatting with? What is the content? What is that? How is that back and forth looking? Um, what kind of games and activities are you going to bring to that interaction? And then finally, context. You know, what is the purpose of the video chat? Uh, as well as who is that other person there to assist that child and, and how can you work with them to get them um, set up to support the interaction overall. Um, so thinking about video interaction and systems, it's, you know, it's one thing to have a conversation for fun with a child that, you know, maybe is in your family, 
uh, but sometimes we need to be doing video interaction in a very specific context for a very specific purpose. So as I mentioned before, um, child welfare, court hearings, um, uh, children incarcerated parents, things like that. So thinking through some of the pros and cons of video and how they might influence the future of using video interaction in these systems. So um, at the beginning, we did a poll where most people felt like there was on balance, uh, it was a helpful innovation for children and families, that there may be barriers that are broken down by being able to have this interaction. For example, maybe, um, you know, rather than only one longer in-person visit, if a, if a parent is working towards reunification, you may be able to fold in more frequent video interaction to keep that connection more regular, even if the individual times are shorter to account for that kind of attention span. Um, looking at things like transportation um, and how doing the video interaction can really break down barriers around potentially lack of transportation and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we don't, there's a lot of value to in-person connection, you know. Um, so in general, we think of from the child's perspective that working over video is, you know, better than no interaction at all, um, better than the telephone. We know for sure that video gives more to kids than maybe audio only or letters, for example. Um, but it still has some of those downsides. And the younger you go in the child's development, the more pronounced those issues are. So for a baby who's really needing that touch, who's needing that high quality eye contact, and who's needing that back and forth, um, and that consistent care, that can only somewhat be approximated through the video medium. You know, a nine or a 12 or a 15 year old, it's a very different story in it, uh, where they are cognitively, where they are developmentally, whether they're able to rely on that interaction and get what they need out of it. Um, but for those younger children, the younger they go, the more drawbacks we really do see there. So thinking about pros and cons, when does it make sense to rely on video technology? When is it actually really important to push for those in-person um, interactions when we can? All right, excellent. Uh, so thinking about those timelines and proceedings, you know, if a, if a parent is working towards reunification and there are guidelines around the types of visits, the frequency and things like that, thinking about whether a video uh, option is going to help with that proceeding. So that's one thing to think about. Um, one, as I mentioned earlier, equity of access. So we know that high-speed internet, um, having the, materials, you know, the technology for it. Not everyone is equally comfortable with technology um, and not not everyone has equal access. So thinking about if we're implementing video as one option, is there still another option? And if there's not, what needs to be done to make sure that um, that communities aren't disparately impacted by that lack of access? Third consideration to think about is privacy and security. So this is both from so, sort of like a tech perspective, you know, um, is, the, is there a secure line? So for example, in telehealth, we might see people using special software that's HIPAA, uh, HIPAA compliant as an example. So there's that type, but there's also privacy and security when there may be complicated family dynamics, there may be domestic violence present, there might be other safety issues where uh, having a direct line, a video line to someone's home may be a safety issue. So thinking through those types of things as well. Fourth would be the quality of information gathered. So if the purpose of the video chat is to ask children questions about their safety, about their well-being, um, knowing that there may be a reduction in that quality of information gathered. If the child, you know, drops the phone and walks away, you're not going to be able to sort of follow them. You're you're stuck with what they're going to give you there. And so thinking about the impact of video um, and young children and the quality of information you may be able to get. In addition, if you're looking at assessing, say, parent-child interactions, you know, are you going to be able to get that information that you need? Um, but other considerations are the convenience um, that you're able to, you know, there's no driving or transportation. 
and that there's a connection uh, that can be made over video even with very, very young children. And that can be a very positive option um, when looking at increasing frequency and connection uh, that may need to happen. So I'm curious if there's anything else uh, thinking about your work um, over the last couple of years in particular, what else has come up for you around um, whether or not video engagement has been a good option for the children and families that you may work with? I'm curious to hear um, what else has come up for people. Any experiences people have had with using video interaction, especially with kids, um, they want to mention or discuss? David said can be empowering to families to have options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. To have an option of what would work best for me and my family in this particular scenario. Um, the technical difficulties um, can be very, very frustrating for children mm -hmm. if those are encountered during and, and break up the conversation. Yeah, that is an excellent point. And you know, there's been some research done. There's a there's a wonderful paper by Rachel Barr um, out of Virginia where she she observed a lot of interactions with toddlers and their grandparents. And one thing she observed was when those tech difficulties happen. So for example, one grandma was kind of like chatting like this, right? You know, way down, and the mom had to be like, you know, come on, mom, you got to, you know, put your head up or she froze, like just happened to me, right? And the kid, from a kid's perspective, um, it's very dysregulating, right? Like what happened to this person I was having this interaction with and they just freeze and stop. And how um, they really need an adult support say, to, to interpret that for them. Oh, they froze, the technology stopped, uh, they'll come back in a minute, but very, I mean, it's frustrating for all of us, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, we've all been there. Um, and so for kids without that cognitive frame to lay on top of it, you know, maybe even doubly so. So, yeah, absolutely. A lot of frustration and, and blocks at times. All right. Um, great. Well, that's all the uh, information I have for you today. If you have any questions, I'm um, happy to take them and, and have a discussion on that. Any questions about what we talked about today with video interaction with young children? Nope, no questions, all right. Um, well, I really appreciate A, your time, and B, your incredible grace and patience as we um, do this fancy trick of, you know, zooming in or webexing in or whatever it is and people are here and people are on youtube and i just want to give a huge shout out to the conference organizers i cannot even imagine how many moving parts you all had so thank you very 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 much for all your hard work on this um, i know it's not easy with those multiple modes and trying to get this to run all at once so i really appreciate it um, and if you have any questions or want to reach out, um, we're at evidentchange.org is our website, and we will be following up with a set of these slides, as well as some, you know, fact sheets and tip sheets that we've put together on this topic. Um, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to get to be able to speak with you all today. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. And very we're going to turn it over to Judge Heidemann to wrap up our conference today. Thank you, Deb. Um, today's conference was intended to take a deeper look at the use of technology in our juvenile justice and child welfare systems to examine our successes and our challenges. You heard from both young adults and families who have experienced the use of technology in their cases firsthand. While there were some aspects of their cases that did benefit from the use of technology, we also heard their frustration and heard that there were instances where the use of technology did not help move their case. Dr. Cynthia Bernson with Evident Change gave us some tips and tricks when dealing with children through virtual interactions. Terry Deal shared with us the results of her virtual hearing study. So what's next? We encourage you to take this information back to your local through the eyes of the child team and into your communities. As I said this morning, 
We must often find creative solutions to difficult situations. That may look different for each of you, but we must always remain focused on improving outcomes for the children, young adults, and families involved in our systems. For some, that may include the use of technology, and for others, it may not. I look forward to hearing about the progress you all make over the next year. Now uh, it's time to pull out your either paper or virtual calendar for some save the date information. First hold September 13th and 14th of next year, 2022, for the Court Improvement Project Children's Summit that will be held in Kearney, Nebraska. The theme for the Children's Summit next year will be Authentic Youth and Family Engagement. And then one other great educational opportunity next year is the Nebraska Young Child Institute. That will also be held in Kearney, Nebraska on June 28th and 29th of 2022. Again, thank you for attending this year's conference. Oh, no, there. Thank you again. Deb. Thank you, Judge Heideman, and thank you to everybody for coming today. So, and thanks everyone for attending our conference and have a great rest of your day.